Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good. Welcome. Good to see you. Good to have you here. Um, it appears that we have some visitors with us here this morning. <laughs> Has, have you guys all met this new couple? Who are they? We did when they came in. You did when they came We had to do it. Right. He had to get out to the church. We remember the name. Well, we're going to wait to turn. He was just passing through. Welcome, man. Mike, you see what we're doing. Great to see you guys. Oh, yeah. Great to be back. How was your trip? Oh, busy. It's good. Busy. Yes. Uneventful. Right on duty. Yeah. Uneventful for the most part. Okay. How's Dad doing, Mike? Pretty good. Mom. Yeah. Good. Mm-hmm. And how's all those grandbabies and oh yeah, all those <laughs> keep us uh, keep us alive, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Glad you guys had a chance to go spend some time with family, especially with the holidays. You all stayed healthy. Everybody's healthy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway, it's great to see you. Good to have you here this morning. Uh, if you open up your Bibles to James chapter one. We we're going to try to start into the second half of the book. We got through the first half, got through all the introductory material as well. There's a lot to it. Um, again, who's the author of the book? James. James. James, there you go. That's the answer right there. Which James? Brother, brother of Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, it's a half brother of Jesus, okay, who was the leader of the Jerusalem church. Um, eventually became leader of the Jerusalem church as well. So, all right, we're going to pick up in the second half here today. Hope you had a good week. Anything new for anybody? No more new grandchildren or anything like that? Children or? Okay. If not, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Okay. Lord God, in many ways, our lives are like a walk through unfamiliar territory in the darkness of night. We're so glad that we have your holy word, which shines upon our pathway, which guides us with the light of truth. Give us the power to walk in the way that your word teaches. And as we open up again and take a look at the second half of the book of James, we ask you, Lord, to open up our minds and open up our spirits in particular to receive your word of joy and gladness to take it to heart, to apply it to our lives, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. We ask this for the sake of Jesus and his kingdom. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we got to verse 16, and we're going to pick up there this morning. And actually, we're going to read from verse 16 all the way down through the end of the chapter, verse 27. So, hopefully you got your Bibles opened up there. And I'm going to ask for any volunteers who want to read. Now, you can read the whole section. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. If you want to read part of it, maybe read half and let somebody else read half, that's fine too. If you've had, you know, a couple cups of coffee and you're feeling strong this morning, you might want to read the whole thing. I don't know. But if somebody would care to start it off and read for us, that'd be great. Starting where? So uh, verse 16, all the way to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> okay. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due or change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be um, a kind of first fruits of his creations or creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, (coughs) slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness. Boy, someone may have to read for me. The implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. 
For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looked, what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks his, he is righteous and does not bridle his bridle, rather, his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father of, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Okay, thank you very much, Gretchen. Um, you might want to have another cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> Well, there you have it. That's what happened. No, I'm just kidding. Just out of curiosity, what what translation were you reading? ESV? Was that ESV? I don't know. It's like, okay. it's English Standard yeah. Version. Yeah, English Standard Version. Yeah. Part of it, I, th I think part of it is just the translation you're reading. It's, you know, the ESV is what the church has switched to ever since NIV back in 2011 went with a, a new translation. They changed up their translation trying to be more politically correct, basically. Um, and many, many churches, our own church body included, you know, basically rejected the new translation. It's not a good translation, as far as I'm concerned. <coughs> Number of places where they really changed it up. So that's why you gotta be careful if you're using the NIV Bible, make sure you have the, what's called the 1984 version. It goes back to 1984. The 2011, they end up changing it quite a bit. The ESV, though, is, is, I'm not a big fan of it. It's okay. Um, it's okay. The New Concordia Study Bible is the English Standard Version. But it's a little bit wooden in its translation. In other words, it's a little bit more difficult to read through. Uh, it doesn't quite flow like the NIV used to do or does. So, anyway, but thank you very much, Gretchen. You did a great job. Well, I was just using the one that's Even though it gives you a hard time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one for those that are hard, for those of us that have yeah. seen. <laughs> well, you know, just so you know, I think most of you know, we have Bibles back there. The blue ones that you have, that's, that's what's called large print. Yeah. And it's a little bit bigger. There's some brown ones, soft covers next to it, that are giant print, even larger. Oh, so, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. So, when I forget my glasses, I'll do it. For some of us, even with our glasses, we need yes. to use the giant print. Um, I'm just kidding as well. There's a lot in here, and I'm going to unpack this for us. Um, what I've entitled this is our quest for godly maturity. Notice dash, 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 with God's help. With God's help. Um, just to get us started off here a little bit, which important attribute of God does James set forth there in verse 17? And why is that reassuring to you? What's that? This is going back to, if you go back to Luther's small catechism, he lists out all the different attributes of God, the characteristics of God, um, the attributes. In particular, which one is this? Anybody know? For example, uh, Luther breaks it down to God is omnipresent, that means he's present everywhere. He is omniscient, that means he's all-knowing. He's omnipotent, means he's all-powerful. He's eternal, he's merciful. He goes, he goes through a number of attributes or characteristics of who God is. Which one is, is James talking about here in verse 17? Luther mentions it, by the way, in the Catechism. Talks about it. Good, good, good gifts. The God is what? He gives us. He is good. He gives us good things. Okay. Well, that's yeah. That's part of it. That's there too. Actually, maybe thank you for pointing that out. You could actually say there's two attributes there. God. That's the first one. What's the one that he's really primarily getting at? God doesn't vary. God. There we go. God doesn't vary. God doesn't 
change. God is unchangeable. The other term that's used oftentimes that Luther even uses, God is immutable. Immutable. He doesn't change. Doesn't change. What does that mean? He doesn't change. Have you guys changed? <laughs> Look back five, ten years ago, have you changed? But how about a week ago? Oh, yeah. How about a week ago? How about yesterday? Yeah, <laughs> Maybe you trimmed your toenails last night. You're, you know, two pounds lighter. I don't know. But we're all changing. We're constantly changing. Everything around us is changing. Someone has pointed out there's nothing more constant in the universe than change. And yet, we are creatures of habit. Right? As soon as this Bible class is over, you're all going to go in the sanctuary and what? You're going to plot down probably pretty close, if not exactly in the spot where you always <laughs> sit. sit. Thank you. <laughs> right? That way you know we're here. That's, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. But that's, but that's dangerous because then I also know when you're not there. Yeah, that's, so, true. that's the other half Which of that. Um, that's the other half of it. Okay, we're just going to church today. Yeah. But, but God is immutable. He is unchangeable. How does that, how does that um, reassure you? And what does that mean for the most part? Have you as a parent ever changed your mind? You told your kids one thing and then you came back and you thought it through a little more carefully. <laughs> changed your mind? Do we change? We change all the time. We're changing our minds all the time. We're changing. How does that reassure you the fact that God, the author of Hebrews says what? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. Right? I think tomorrow, he's forever. reliable. He's reliable. Thank you, Gretchen. Yeah, good. God is reliable. Does that reassure you? Yes. Yeah. It should. God is not whimsical he doesn't turn around and just change his mind with which way the wind blows he's not a politician and tries to see which way the political winds are blowing God always is faithful he will keep that faithfulness that's one of the one of the characteristics I oftentimes point out to people when I go to have a prayer with them prior to service or surgery because they're they're back in there, they've got them all prepped, they're ready to go, we come back there, and I can tell, you can always sense there's a bit of nervousness, right? Because you don't know, it's unexpected. One never knows. I mean, we've all known somebody, what, who went on the table, thinking it was gonna be just a regular surgery, and find out they died on the table, <clears throat> right? But, you know, we <clears throat> there's oftentimes worry and nervousness behind it. And one of the things I always try to point out to him, I'm going, who's with you right now? God is. Has God changed? No, he doesn't. Has God taken care of you up until this moment? Prior to your surgery? Yeah. Has he ever let you down? No. Has he always taken care of you? Yeah. Right? So is God going to change while you're on the table with the surgeon's hands? His hands are going to be on top of the surgeon's hands. He's going to be guiding them. God's the one who's in control. He doesn't change. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loved you prior to surgery. He's going to love you during surgery. And guess what? He's going to love you after surgery. God does not change. God is always with you. You're going through a difficulty in your life. He's not going to turn to abandon you. Well, I'm sorry, boy, Woo. they got themselves in a heap of trouble. I can't handle this one. I'm out of here. Does God say that? No. God is always with you. So the fact that he is immutable, he is unchangeable, should bring tremendous reassurance and strength to us, right? And yet so oftentimes, sinful human beings, what do we do? We take our, what? <clears throat> Fickleness, right? We change this day, change that day, have a different opinion, whatever. We change it. We take our fickleness and we turn around and we what? Interject it on God. I'm fickle, so God must be what? Fickle. 
No. No. And do you understand? That's an important, so very, very important. Let me get into it. what James wrote in the previous verses that we looked at earlier. And what he says here in verse 16, he was responding to a problem regarding his people, those who had fled Jerusalem. It was a serious matter for people to have misconceptions about how to respond to the circumstances into which they have fallen because of their allegiance to Christ, the Christian way of life. Right? Have you ever, you ever done that? You try to follow Christ in your life? You, you try to do what he wants you to do, you, you confess him, and then all of a sudden what? You start getting in trouble. People start challenging you. People start mocking you. People start making fun of you. And you go, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I felt from the time of confirmation class, when I was going through confirmation, when I was just, you know, a little bit taller than knee high to a grasshopper, right, in junior high, I felt the Lord was calling me in the ministry. I went into my freshman English class, very first day of class, the teacher had us, we were all sitting there, she had us go around, apparently she didn't have anything prepared for that day. <laughs> in all fairness to her, she was just trying to get to know us better. She turned around and we were all sitting alphabetically, she started with the Z's, got all the way up you know, to the B's and the A's, right? So Bastion, I'm sitting on the tail end over here. But she started with the Z's, you know, went backwards through the, through the uh, alphabet. And she said, tell us your name, right? And we had to share various information, but the one thing we had to share apart from her name and other things was, what do you want to do when you grow up, when you're, you know, for a living? So everybody's going down, right? They're going through, and I, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a nurse, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be, you know, whatever. Got to have yeah, an organist. Um, we need organists. Yeah. But anyway, they were going through that, and it was getting towards the end of the hour because she was she was dialoguing with each of the students as they were going through it. And finally, gets down to the end. I think there's probably maybe one, two other people besides myself. Yeah. And it comes to to me, Bastion, and I told her my name, and I said, I want to be a pastor. And I'm telling you, this was a public high school. And the whole class just erupted into laughter. Oh my gosh. Ah, he wants to be a pastor. You know, yeah, no, seriously. And I took, and right after that class, the bell rang shortly thereafter. I went out in the hallway. Man, I took a ton of ribbing. Bastion wants to be a preacher. I think a lot of those people now have a great deal of respect for me. <laughs> now that they've grown up and matured some of them. But, but here's the point. It's just, you know, at that point in time, what did I, I mean, I was, just a, I was just a young pup, right, in the, in the Christian faith. And, and I'm thinking, man, I got persecuted. That was the last time I mentioned I wanted to be a pastor the rest of high school. And I think in some respects, I probably tried to show them that I'm just as normal as they are, and I got myself in trouble right along with a lot of the other ones. But, but nonetheless, that's, you know, they, they're having misconceptions. James has to do his best here to show them that God was not behind these temptations. Therefore, verse 16 begins, and this one I'm going to point out to you because, Gretchen, when you read it, begins, it actually begins with a present tense imperative. Okay? Present tense imperative. Imperative is what? A command. And Gretchen, you, you read it um, in the text there. It said what? Don't be deceived. I think it said. Do not be deceived. Do not, yeah, be, do not be deceived. It is that, that phrase is best rendered stop being deceived. In other words, it's present tense, it's ongoing. And it's, it's an imperative, it's a command. In other words, they are being deceived. He's saying, stop being deceived. All right? In verses 16 and 17, James helps troubled and hurting Christians see that God does not want to hurt his children. Now listen carefully. Everything in our lives that's truly good and holy comes from God. 
who, what, dwells above the heavenly lights. No, really, it's talking about the stars there, right? It's talking about the heavens and stars. God does not change loving us one minute and then turning on us in the next minute. So God is, you know, our love, our love is conditional. It is. Let's be honest. I don't care. If, I don't care how good of a parent you are. Your love is conditional. I don't care how good of a spouse you are. Your love is conditional. God is. God's love is unconditional. He doesn't turn around and say, "Okay, right." You know, I love you, and then right and turns around and sins. And God says, "Oh, I don't love right anymore. I don't love him as much as I loved him." You know, two minutes ago. No, God doesn't do that. So, he is the Lord, he is the God of steadfast covenant love. That kesed, that Hebrew word that I've talked about in the past, who does not change like shifting shadows. That's how the NIV puts it there. He's not like the heavenly lights, which go through their daily cycle of appearing to change between light and darkness due to the rotation of the earth on its axis. Right? So in other words, the moon is shining there, and eventually all of a sudden, whoosh, the moon kind of goes away. The point is, God is always good, and he does only good things, period, right? Period. I think I, let's see, I got that. I'm sure I had that on there. Maybe, maybe my slides didn't update. Okay. It may not have updated before I opened it up here. Um, he gave us our physical lives, and then he gave us rebirth through his mighty word into spiritual life so that we might be a kind of what he calls first fruits. First fruits. That word comes from the Old Testament, the first fruits. And Israel was to take the first fruits of the harvest and do what? Present it to God. That's where the tithe comes in, the 10%. They were to take the top 10%, the first fruits, the, the very part of it, and, and then turn around and give it to God. Why did they do that? Because it was an act of faith on their part, saying that we recognize everything we have comes from God. And that God is going to provide for us. In fact, we're going to give him the first 10% because we know he's going to take care of us. And, and God's going to pro provide everything that we need for this life. And that's why we give. Giving to God is an act of worship. And giving the first fruit meant giving him the best. Giving him the absolute best of the first fruits. This not temptation into sin is God's gracious will for us. God does not tempt us, guys. He doesn't tempt us into sin. Remember? God tests us, but he does it for the sake of what? Strengthening our faith. Drawing us closer to him. Temptation means I'm going to trip you up. I'm going to try to make you fall and stumble and fall flat on your face. I'm going to try to lead you astray. And that's what's behind temptation. The comforting thought will help us trust our Heavenly Father in everything. God's saying, I'm not going to tempt you. I will allow at times for temptation to come, but knowing that you have, he's provided what? A way out of that temptation, right? I mentioned it last week. I love the statement by Martin Luther. He said, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from what? Building a nest in your hair. So you can't stop the temptation, but you can keep from giving into it. God will give you a way out. He will give you the strength through the Holy Spirit to say no. And God only wants what's good for you. James goes on to say, remember this, remember this as you think about God's involvement in the circumstances of your life. It was God's idea to bring us to faith. And that's what he started to get at there in that next verse. In fact, he's telling us what is all God's doing. From start to finished, 
God accomplished this wonderful thing in our lives by the word of truth, verse 18. Um, by his, the word of truth. Yeah, that's, there is what I was looking for before. Maybe now. Okay. It, it kind of reminds me of Ephesians 2.10. By the way, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. If you do not have those verses highlighted, starred, or marked in your Bible, please, please do so. And I will vouch for you, you will not go to hell by marking in your Bible. Some people think that. My mother, in her generation, thought that. She said, I can't mark in the Bible. That's, that's blasphemy. I'm going, are you kidding me? Taking God's name in vain is blasphemy. Calling God, telling God's a liar, where that's blasphemy. Mark in your Bibles, it's okay. Yeah, I love Ephesians 2, 8, 2, I love Ephesians 8, 9, 10. Right? Anybody have it? Turn to it. I've got verse 10 up here. I can turn on the phone for you, but we're so not the masterpiece. Go to verse 8, by me, excuse me. Yeah, I'm sorry, start with verse 8. God saved you for his special favor when you believe. You, you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So that we can do good things. So we, we can do the good things he planned for us as long yeah, good things he planned for us to do. Mike, what translation is that? Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought NLT of it. What's that? I have it started. All right, Dave, you have to have the back. I don't think so. I've said this before, Donna. You must have been in a former Bible study where I said, make sure you highlight that. Yes. Um, but no, that's good. I'm glad you did. Guys, these there's some verses that are just so important you gotta highlight them so they pop out and jump out at you. This is one of them. We are justified by grace through faith. That's what Paul's telling us there. And what it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is what a <clears throat> Mike read it in the NLT. It is a gift of God. Lest any man should what? Both. You and I cannot turn around and pat ourselves on the back. And say, look at me, look at me, I brought myself to faith. And yet that's what a lot of Christians nowadays do. Some of our Baptist brothers and sisters and other non-denominational village. You know, when did you make a decision for Christ? Right? How many times have we heard that? <clears throat> I've heard it, I don't know how many times. When did you make a decision? I said, I didn't make a decision. God chose me. Isn't that what Paul says? Isn't that what James says here? God chose us. It's not the other way around. I mentioned in my sermon last Sunday, we don't suddenly sit up one morning and say, I'm going to vote for Jesus today. We don't have the wherewithal, the spiritual maturity, the strength to do that. Why? Because we're spiritually blind. We are what? Spiritually blind. Enemies of God. I remember the third one, my goodness. Oh my goodness, there's three strikes Paul gives us. Spiritually blind, spiritually dead. That's what. Spiritually blind, spiritually dead, and, and what? Enemies of God. Those three things. Right there, we were struck out the plate before we ever stepped up to it. We can't turn around and hit the ball. Only the Holy Spirit enables us to do that. And that's what Scripture, guys, Drills home time and time again. It's called divine monergism. From start to finish, it's the Holy Spirit. It's God who brings us to faith. Don't try to lay claim to it. And this is the discussions I had. I think, you know, being in Northeast Texas, over in East Texas a lot, being surrounded by my other brothers and sisters in Christ who think they made a decision for him, I'm going... We can't make that decision. The Holy Spirit can lead us to that, but the Holy Spirit's the one who does it. And here's the thing I would point out to him. When you turn around and claim you brought yourself to faith, who gets the glory? If 
you turn around and say, I made a decision for Jesus, I voted for Jesus, and I chose him as my Lord and Savior, who gets the glory? I. Uh, no. We do. Yeah. You're right, Dave, but I do, meaning I'm the one who says it. We do. We all do. And I point that out to people, I go, uh-uh. You and I deserve nothing but eternal damnation. God gets the glory because God's the one who chose us. And he tells that to his disciples. He tells that to all of us. I chose you. Now, how wonderful is that? Right? Um, James, James doesn't elaborate a whole lot on this, probably because he knows he isn't telling them anything that they don't already know. <clears throat> However, in saying what he did, James shows that he is fully, that he fully understood the idea of justification by faith through grace. Justification by grace through faith. Our faith, which brings us into a blessed relationship with God, is God's gift. Let me go. Yeah, Ephesians 2. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, it's the fruits of faith. But we're God's workmanship. I love what NLT said, Mike, I really do. I, I think that's really not a bad translation in verse 10 there, where it says we are God's masterpiece. Because that's the idea behind the Greek word there. We are God's masterpiece. Does a, does a piece of canvas paint itself? No. If I take and put a blank canvas up here and just go, I'll wait five minutes here, it'll be done in a second. Does the canvas paint itself? No. Who paints it? An artist. Someone on the <coughs> outside. Someone who has the gift to pick up the paintbrush and mix the colors and paint a masterpiece. The canvas doesn't just suddenly go from blank to, you know, you know, you pick the master because I don't care. Um, Whistler's mother, I don't care. I mean, it just doesn't go from the moon. It takes someone who did it. And God is the artist. We're his workmanship. In giving a second birth to us, God also had in mind that we should be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The people with Jewish background knew about the first fruits. The first fruits of the trees and the crops were to be offered to God as part of their worship. And I was just talking about that. Furthermore, they were to be, the, the fruit that they gave to God was to be without spot or blemish um, according to the Levitical law. Remember when they were to offer up the Passover lamb, the lamb had certain qualifications, specifications, right? And one of them was the lamb was to be one year old male. And what else? Without blemish, without spot, a perfect lamb. In other words, you couldn't have a you know a lamb that was 99.9% .9 white and then have one little black spot over here on his hip. That'd be an absolutely perfect lamb. Because it was pointing forward to who? To Christ. That certainly was God's wish for the new members of his earthly family to whom he had now given the spiritual birth. He wanted them to reflect his nature, his God's innate goodness, which Gretchen pointed out earlier. This wasn't a new idea for the children of God in that day and time. Sounds a lot like the Apostle Paul who wrote to the Ephesians what we just read. The bottom line is that if God has gone to so much trouble to bring us to faith and to set our feet on the pathway of righteousness, does it make sense that he would try to put obstacles in our way that would trip us up? In other words, if God has brought you and I to faith and planted us here and said, now go live the life that I called you to live, would God try to trip us up with temptations? No. Of course not, right? Of course not. No way. And don't ever forget it. He says, notice verse 19, what? My dear brothers. My dear brother. 
And by the way, when it's used here, he's talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. This is one of those times where brothers means everyone within the faith. The point is, each person has responsibility to take care of his or her life. If this new God-given life is to flourish and express itself to the fullest, James spells this out in the rest of chapter 1. We're going to see that. Now understand this, James hated hypocrisy in people's worship and in their professed religion. Right? We, we Sometimes you hear that they're a nominal Christian. What's that mean? Christian by name only. Well, that could be the difficulty is hard for you and I to what? Judge that. Okay? Because we can't look into the heart. Only God can. And we can look at the fruits. His strong words on hypocrisy in this compact little section, the end of chapter 1 here, what is going to re-echo later in the letter, by the way. Remember I told you James kind of touches on something, then he touches on it again, then he kind of touches on it again. And each time he kind of expands it more and more, a little bit. Hypocrisy comes from the Greek word, means one who wears a mask. Isn't that interesting? Hypocrisy, one who wears a mask. In other words, what? Come on, you show up on Sunday morning, put on your best mask, right? But as soon as you get out of the church building, into the car, you're what? Beating your kids, kicking the dog, screaming at your wife, you know? Yeah, okay, I beat my wife, but I don't beat her that often. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things, right? So, anyway, one important aspect of faith for real life is our willingness to listen to God, to humbly accept his word, and then to act on what we know to be the truth. Okay? What causes spiritual breakdown in Christians' people's thoughts and actions? That's the question that James is kind of dealing with here. In other words, how can reborn Christians become hypocrites? How many times have we heard that? I come to church, but it's full of hypocrites. <laughs> And I always tell them, come on over, we can always use one more. <laughs> right? How do we how do we know who's a hypocrite? I don't. You know, here, here's the thing. I, I love it in our Lutheran doctrine, we teach the invisible church, the visible and the invisible church. And what that means, Luther was really good about defining this. Visible church is any given church. In other words, essentially Lutheran church, Zion Lutheran Church, St. Luke's. Roman Catholic Church, you know, Coronado Baptist Church. They're all visible churches, but within those visible churches, we find the invisible church. What does that mean? It means this, not everybody who attends a church is a true Christian. You go, well, Pastor, how? No, I don't know. People come to church for all kinds of reasons. You know? How many times has somebody paid lip service to God and then say some, suddenly things are going bad in their life, they show up for a Sunday or two, things get straightened out in their life, and we don't see them again for how long? But don't treat God as a lucky rabbit's foot. Right? We, we don't know. I don't know who. Guys, when I go forward in worship, my prayer generally at the altar has been very similar. For how many years I pray. And you know what it is when I go up front? God, I don't know who's all here today. You do. I don't know where they're at in their relationship with you. You do. I pray that if there's someone here who merely shows up because their wife grabs them by the ear and says we're going to church, pulls them, or they're here because they're trying to sell more insurance or real estate or whatever, I don't know. You do, but I pray that you will open up their hearts to hear the message of the law and the gospel and to come to faith in Christ. I don't know. God does, because you can't, the reason we call it, why do we call it invisible, the invisible church? Can Ryden 
look into Mike's heart or Christy's heart and see faith? He doesn't have that ability. And vice versa, by the way. He doesn't have that ability. Only God has the ability to see faith or not. That's why we call it invisible, the invisible church. The invisible church is made up of believers in all denominations across the world who confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Right? And so that's what James is kind of getting at here a little bit. Let me pick up where I did. Um, James has three answers, okay? Let me, I, I'm pretty sure I hope it's up there. Yeah, there it is. I think what it did is it, it finally caught up with itself. Because I plugged in right away, I quick hooked it up, and I had worked on this early, later in the week, and it didn't, it hadn't quite updated. But notice, here's the three things James goes through, right? James has three answers. He says, one, we don't listen, either to God or to one another, well or enough. And this is serious. We all need regular exhortation to pay attention to the word, which, quote, which can save you. Right? The word is what saves us. Two, we talk too much. No one ever learns anything by talking. You ever notice that? Three, we don't always deal very well with anger and often let it fill our hearts. Unrighteous anger poisons all relationships. Listen closely. It never goes away by itself, but rather accumulates daily, leaving less and less room for patience, kindness, understanding, and forgiveness. You understand what he's getting at here? Why is anger such a bad thing according to verses 19 and 20? What does James say? Human anger does not produce righteousness. It does not produce righteousness. It does not produce a righteous life. Just if you have feelings of anger, how do you deal with them? That's the question here. And I want you to keep your finger there in James 1. Just for a moment, flip back. In other words, go back towards Genesis to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. And then whoever turns to it would read it for us. Whoever gets there, Ephesians 4, 26. This is a great word from St. Paul. Ruthann, you have it? Yeah. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Okay. Notice what Paul says there. Is he saying that all anger is sinful? No. Nope. He's not. How many times have we gotten angry and said, oh man, I sinned? Not necessarily, it all depends. What's it depend on? That's the question. How is it, did Jesus, let me back up, did Jesus get angry? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. When did he get angry? Because Barry burned his toast? <laughs> no. Chasing money changers out of the temple. Yep. No. Driving the money changers out of the temple. Because they had turned his father's house into what? A den of thieves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> What's that mean? What that means is, and what he's referring there to, by the way, guys, I wish I had a picture of the temple I put it up here, is you've got the actual temple building complex. Outside of that, you have what's called the court of women which went around the temple. That's as far as women could go. They could not go any further. Then, then you had the court of the Gentiles. That's what he was referring to. That's where he was when he made that statement. 
The court of the Gentiles meant that that was all the further that a Gentile could go. They could not go any further. There were guards at the gates that would have killed them if they did. And that was understood. Do not proceed past this point or else. Jesus made that comment in the court of the Gentiles because that God loves all nations, all people, not just the Jews. The Jews made it very inclusive, right? You had to be a good Jew in good standing. Even if you were a bad Jew, you didn't qualify. But especially for Gentiles, that was the only place where they could come and worship the God of Israel, the true God, to seek after him. And they had turned it into what? A carnival. Because you could not basically bring your own animals for, for sacrifice at the temple. You had to purchase an animal there. And if you came from, you know, Nazareth, whatever, you didn't have the right coinage. So you had to exchange your coinage for temple coinage. There was a special coinage that was used for the temple. And you had to exchange it. Well, guess what? <laughs> you could give them $10 of Nazareth coinage, and you'd get what? Six fifty dollars back in temple coinage. You understand? So they were ripping them off. They were overcharging for the animals, too. <laughs> It all came down to greed and the love of money. They weren't worshiping God. They were using God to get what they wanted. Their hearts were far from him. And that's where Jesus gets angry because all the noise that's going on, the bleeding of the animals, the you know, the 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 bait, the, the the moving of the oxen and everything, all the noise. Imagine how noisy that must have been, the clanging of the coins and everything. How would you try to pray in that situation? It would be very difficult. If we had a prayer time here, you came forward, you knelt at the altar, and you're trying to pray quietly and silently, and I come in. And I've got one of those, you know, you've seen them, the drums, the client cymbals, you know. I've got bells on my, on my kneecaps. I've got a harmonica right here. And you're going, oh, I'm so glad pastor's here. <laughs> not, not. But that's, in essence, guys, what was going on. And that's why Jesus says, he, notice what Paul's saying here. Not all anger is unrighteous. Jesus had righteous anger. His anger was holy. And there is certain situations where that occurs against evil and sin. Anger is every bit expressible and should be because what's happening is unrighteous. And it is it is hindering the Holy Spirit. And there's times we do that. The problem is, the problem is that too often times, oh, our time is up. The problem is, uh, what is the other thing that Paul says in Ephesians 4, 26? Don't let your anger, what? Lead you. Yeah, don't let, it, don't let the sun set on it. There's a good purpose behind that. You're not going to sleep too well, by the way. But he says, what? Yes, sin, don't, don't let your anger lead you to sin. Right. Most oftentimes, guys, let's be totally honest, our anger is unrighteous. Because why? Our human pride. Our pride got hurt. Or whatever. Or, you know, we were made to look bad or whatever. It, it comes from selfish reasons. But there is other times when that anger is very much righteous and, and necessary. And it should be expressed. You know what? I'm going to stop here. There's, we're going to still talk about anger next time. Pastor? Yeah. Can we as sort of an exercise for next time? Each of us bring an example of a place where our Lord was angry. Other than the chasing out of the money changers. Yeah, there were other times he was. If it, 
Can we be charged with trying to find those? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because there are. Them? Sure. There are. Maybe a little bit off your lesson plan, but uh, you know, not seriously. No. No, it's okay. Because you're right, right? And there's there's a number of places yeah. where Jesus. It doesn't necessarily come out and say he was angry, but you can't help but think, man, he didn't, he was upset. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, if you find someone, like, yeah, go ahead, do that. Okay. It's funny, whenever I ask when Jesus get angry, it's always a temple, right? And that's, that's a given one. He was. But there's other times he was too. And you can look at those closely because, guys, Jesus did not sin. He was without sin. So you know when that's happening, there is a righteous reason behind what he's doing. I can think of some right now that come to mind. I'm not going to say it because I don't want to give them away. I want you to find them. Okay? Yeah, that'd be good, right? Okay? Anyone else? When you find yourself starting to get angry, stop for a moment and ask yourself, why am I angry? And I think, honestly, if we're truly do some introspection and we're truly honest with ourselves much of it the times because our ego, our pride got hurt. But there are times, most definitely, there's been times in my ministry I've gotten angry and it had nothing to do with me. It had to do with the fact that what people were doing to the sake of Christ's kingdom and the gospel. And so there are times for righteous anger. And rightly so. Okay. Let's stop here this morning. We'll pick up. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time as we dig into the word of James. And he has such great practical advice for us in our daily lives. Lord, we want to do what you have called us to do, to bear witness to that beautiful life, the spiritual life that you've given to us. You're the one who created faith in our hearts and brought us to faith to the point where we confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. And without the Holy Spirit, without the word of God, we would not be able to do that. We thank you for your word, and we ask you, Lord, to be with us as we pick it up and as we work our way through it to come to a greater understanding. The beautiful part is your word tells us that so often, even though we know all that, we still fail you. And Lord, we sin against one another, and we sin against you. And Lord, we are truly contrite in our hearts and sorry for that, and turn back to you for forgiveness. And you remind us that through the waters of holy baptism, we receive the forgiveness of your son. He washed us and cleansed us. Indeed, we are your baptized children. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for this time together. Be with these brothers and sisters in the coming week. Lord, as we continue to read and study your word and grow in our faith, for the sake of Jesus, we pray all this. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great day. We'll see you in just a moment.